Okay, this is going to be my first blog type video, and I'm going to be talking about some subject matter that's a little bit deeper than what you normally see coming out of this channel. The only reason I have Metroid playing in the background here is so that you don't have to stare at a still picture the whole time I'm doing this. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to use deductive reasoning to try and explain why I believe in objective morality and inalienable rights. I'm going to start with an assumption that I believe anyone would agree with whether they are moral objectivists or subjectivists. And that would be that morality cannot exist in a vacuum. Morality is a logical abstraction. And if the universe were only made up of matter and energy devoid of any form of life, then it would also be devoid of any form of morality. No physical occurrence could ever be considered immoral. The next postulate would be that if there was only one living entity in existence, I think most people would also agree that in this scenario there would be no possibility of any kind of objective morality. If this entity wanted to create a system of objective morality for himself, he would be unable to because the only possible measurements of his actions would be their level of practicality towards achieving his own goals, and therefore subjective. Do you then call this subjective morality? The phrase is an oxymoron. If something is subjective, then it can't be morality. How would you distinguish subjective morality from mere opinion? You couldn't. That means that the phrase would not serve any purpose because you could interchange any instance of the phrase subjective morality with the word opinion. And since words are merely representations of ideas, if you have a word or phrase that doesn't contain any unique meaning, then it doesn't really exist. So for all intents and purposes, subjective morality cannot exist. So what about objective morality? Can it exist? If so, then how? To have any kind of objective morality, you would need at least two living entities. Now we have to apply what we learned in the one entity universe to this one. Since anything that a living entity does in a universe where he is alone cannot be considered immoral, we must also infer that in a universe with two living beings, anything one being chooses to do that does not affect the other being cannot be considered immoral either. Morality can only be applied to interaction between two or more living entities, and it must be completely divorced from any kind of opinion. Even if everyone tried to create a system of morality based on an opinion that they all agreed on, it would again be merely a system of practicality towards achieving certain goals, just like in the universe with only one entity, which would still be equally subjective, no matter how many people shared those goals, and therefore would not truly be morality. Only logic can be used to, de to determine what constitutes moral interaction. Logic allows us to transcend our own desires because any two people using logic, if given the same variables, will produce the same answer. Morality is merely a certain category of logic. Morality could be defined as the range of logic which deals with interaction between living beings. This also discounts the ability of a god to create morality. I would like to emphasize that God is not only unnecessary for morality, his existence is completely irrelevant to the subject. God's will, which could also be called God's opinion, is still just an opinion. It has no more intrinsic value, even in the abstract. No god would have the power to elevate an opinion from its status any more than he can make A not equal C when A equals B and B equals C. Since all variables are declared in this construct, any changes that god could possibly make are already accounted for. This is not some sort of philosophical masturbation along the lines of could God make an object so heavy that he couldn't lift it? Morality is an abstraction where the details really do matter because it has definite real-world application. No one can prove with certainty whether God does or does not exist, but we can with certainty place limits on his role in our lives. This also shows why the Dawkins argument for the evolution of morality is insufficient. The Dawkins explanation is an ad hoc response for something that is a loaded question in the first place. If someone asked the question, where does morality come from if there is no God, the only correct answer is, 
the same place it comes from if there is a god. Any sort of fascism and even democracy are also discounted. Might cannot make right because might has no intrinsic objective value and neither does popular opinion. So now that we've established all the most common ideas that are mistaken to be morals but certainly cannot be considered as such, we can figure out what concepts can qualify as morality. If you can prove that any specific action is without a doubt not something to be considered objectively immoral, then you can understand with certainty that you have a sacred and inalienable right to perform that action. We already know what actions fit such a description. Any action that does not directly affect another living entity cannot be considered immoral, and by extension, neither can any action that is consented to by all parties involved be considered immoral. This is why we have rights, and it also discounts the ability of either the state or of God to either give or take away rights from anyone else. You would also have to ask the question, if God gave us our rights, then who gave him the right to give us our rights, and who gave that guy that right, ad infinitum. George Carlin was absolutely wrong about this one. We have rights that no one can take away from us. Governments sometimes violate our rights, but they cannot take our rights away from us. This is an important distinction because if you don't understand this concept, then you will willingly give up your sovereignty to whoever you consider to be an authority. And there is no such thing as authority. And this also brings us to understand the one action that is objectively evil. There is only one action that is objectively evil, and that is violating any one of another person's inalienable rights. Now this is an absolute fact, and I know that people are justifiably turned off to dealing with absolutes, but this one is unavoidable. If you choose to reject this one fact, then you are rejecting logic itself. This would be wrong because if you reject logic, then you would be a hypocrite if you ever complained about anything. We should also consider what the alternative to this is. If nobody had any inalienable rights, then anything would be permissible, including slavery. If this were allowed, then we would have different classes of people, some of whom would have no rights, and some of whom would have rights of gross proportions. Not only is this in direct violation of every bit of common sense and compassion that we as a species possess, but the burden of proof would also definitely lay on those in favor of this system. First of all, they would have to prove that there are fundamental differences between certain classes of people. Then they would also have to prove that there is some sort of correlation between those differences and the rights or lack of rights that they would like to attribute to each different one. 